I'd like to call the Sunderland Elementary School Committee to order uh, May 17th at uh, 5.02 p.m. Um, we have two minutes to approve uh, the March 15th and the special meeting of May 3rd. Any so motions? Move. So yep. move. Second. 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 Outstanding. All right. Um, Jessica? Yes. Peter? Yes. Megan? Yes. Keith? Yes. Greg? Yes. Outstanding. All right. Um, Peter, uh, I know you said you were hoping to uh, move some of the later discussion uh, to the top about insurance stuff. Jessica, you contacted me separately that uh, there are some people we, you were actually hoping to wait for uh, on. Uh... That was the select board. I thought that they were supposed to be attending and then they decided for open meeting law reasons they shouldn't. So they are not coming. So moving it up makes sense to me. All right. So let's uh, let's see. Um, the only thing is you've got some public comment also on insurance that yeah, yeah. should probably be heard first. I 100% I, I agree. So, uh, yeah. Shall we start with the CPAC and then move on? I, I feel like that'll, yeah, get the uh, things out of the way as quickly as possible. Apologize to uh, anyone who has to sit through something that's, that's not on their agenda. But, uh, yeah, to your point, uh, let's move to the CPAC if we can. Hello, so my name is Asia Cerrone and I co-chair the District CPAC. I want to start by giving a huge thank you to all the admin, general ed teachers, special ed teachers, related service providers, and IAs that dedicate themselves to our special education students in this district. In the state of Massachusetts, each school district has to have a CPAC, and one of the main duties is to evaluate the special education programming and provide feedback to you guys. The other role that we serve within this community is supporting and educating families. So this year we held a variety of meetings. We had business meetings with admin and school committee members, networking nights for families, staff, and community, and a variety of informational workshops along with our twice monthly family support groups. During our family support groups, through our monthly newsletter, emails, and our private Facebook group, we answer special education questions, help families get connected with each other, give referral information on services and specialists within the community, and share local events. Throughout the year, we collaborated with the district at our business meetings and behind the scenes. We um, had our board members join the Anti-Racism and Equity Committee, and we worked with Karen Ferrandino and Tina Jem on an updated restraint prevention and behavior support procedure. In order to evaluate the district, we reviewed <coughs> policies and procedures, gathered state data, talked to administrators throughout the school year, used family reports, and looked at the district survey data. So Sunderland has 54 IEP students, which is about 28% of the total school population, and that's the highest within the district. Of the 54 IEP students, seven are school choice into Sunderland. Two are homeschooled, and there are no out-of-district placements coming into the school. There are six special education teachers, and that gives you a nine-to-one special ed to student ratio, which is on par with most of the other schools in the district. And Sunderland has two students that are in out-of-district placements at other schools that were better able to meet their needs. The BSEA is a state agency that helps with um, the IEP development process. So these numbers help gauge if families are having issues agreeing to an IEP with the school. Unfortunately, they only provide district-wide statistics, so it's unclear how many of these are actually at Sunderland, but it does give us kind of an overview of how things are going. So this year, there were 14 rejected IEPs, seven requests for facilitated IEP meetings, four requests for mediation, and no hearings. And those kind of go in order of kind of like severity, like first you reject an IEP and then you ask for a facilitated meeting. So you can kind of see how far things got with people. PRS is a state agency that investigates claims that a school is not following IEP laws. And over the past year, Sunderland has had two PRS complaints against them. 
This year, we did a joint survey with the district that went out on Parent Square, and overall, the results were pretty positive on the district level. Sunderland had a 24% response rate and mostly positive as well. Families seemed to either really like or really dislike the district. There wasn't really a lot of neutral responses there. And families reported that staff was their favorite part of the district. Atmosphere scored the highest on areas of improvement, but it was a fairly low percentage overall. District-wide, there were a few negative comments about collaboration with families, culturally responsive interactions with families, following the IEP and progress report accuracy. Um, but I don't have the data of which ones were actually at Sunderland, but that's just more of a district-wide view of things. Um, the following are some district-wide recommendations, some of which were made based on issues happening at other schools, um, but I think all of them would benefit every school, so they're worth noting. We recommend uh, professional development on the new restraint prevention and behavior support procedure and the special education procedures manual. We'd like to see professional development on the IEP process, goal writing, documentation, and timeline requirements on a yearly basis, just as a nice refresher for everyone and keep everyone on track. We'd also like to see a PD on the stress that families of students with disabilities experience, how to best collaborate with these families during times of stress, and how to repair strained relationships so that we can get the families who provided low ratings on this survey to feel more comfortable with the district. The CPAC is also recommending that the anti-racism and equity work continue to expand to include a variety of minority populations, including students with disabilities. We'd like to see culturally responsive classrooms in regards to physical, sensory, cognitive, emotional, and behavioral disabilities. Um, we've been kind of working on getting some, some different book recommendations out to teachers um, so that we can have a little more inclusion there. We'd like to see a training on how to interact with IEP families in a culturally responsive manner, which includes race and ethnicity, but for this population, it also includes specific subcultures like the deaf culture or the neurodiversity community. We recommend increased oversight through random auditing of IEPs to ensure that accommodations and services are being provided, that timelines and laws are being followed, and that progress reports are accurate. And having the audited IEP family complete like a quick questionnaire about their experiences would help, um, we think, get more data. So we recommend that as part of the process. And the hope is that this self-monitoring allows administrators to pick up on issues prior to an OCR complaint or a PRS or a BSEA complaint against the district. Given the feedback that we've gotten about transitions, um, this is mostly in our meetings. Um, we recommend more collaboration between the preschool program, elementary school, and Frontier, just so we can get kids going from one step to the other a little more smoothly. And survey results show that there's a small portion of families that are not feeling like they're getting enough input or they're having, they don't feel like they have enough information and training to fully participate in their child's IEP. So we're just recommending more outreach to all the families to help bridge some of these gaps. More specifically for Sunderland, we're recommending getting some more data on how it could improve the atmosphere for IEP families. Um, adding an adjustment counselor would really help with behavioral difficulties and having more subs available so that the special education staff aren't pulled from their regular duties to go fill someone else's role. Um, so that is about it. Does anyone have any questions? Jessica? Uh, yeah, thank you for all of the work the CPAC has been doing this year, year and for this um, very thorough report. Uh, I'm particularly grateful that you're uh, identifying the need for another adjustment counselor in the school, which is a budgeting issue and being able to say this was also a CPAC recommendation is just one more you know, mark in the column uh, to promote that. Um, with the reference, the, the reference to needing more substitute teachers so that staff can do their assigned jobs, um, are, are one-on-ones being pulled away? From so their it's responsibilities a or something? I'm not clear on that. Yeah, so usually it's a special ed teacher would have to go fill the role of an IA. So if they are providing that one-on-one -on -one support to a student, even if it's just for part of the day, they weren't providing reading support or math support or something else to another student. Outstanding. Peter? 
Um, just a couple, just quick question. Uh, you reported last year, I guess about this time, I can't remember exactly when it was, but my sense was that that was a little more negative about the problem Sunderland was having. And I don't know if I'm correct in that or if you could, you know, if we in fact made any progress or just wondering. I think there has been a lot of progress at Sunderland with the new position that was added. The educational team leader is somebody who gets to kind of organize the meetings, have everything kind of done behind the scenes so that our special ed teachers are doing their jobs. They're with the students and working on those things one-on-one. -on -one. So I think a lot of families are really happy with that. And we're really thankful that you guys listened and took that into consideration last year. Well, I'm glad to hear that because I know it was, uh, it was actually the administration that, that led the way on that. And um, um, it was good that we were able to do it. Uh, the other thing I was just, uh, I noticed reading your report was that the I, I was a little disappointed by the percentage of people that replied to your survey. And I didn't know if we in fact got what's a normal return or whether you felt the same or differently. I felt kind of the same. I mean, it was probably about 25% for most schools. Um, it went out on Parent Square. Karen Ferrandino put it out. I don't know exactly if there's different buttons we could push or something to make it get out to more people next time. Um, but I think it was a good first run at us doing a collaborative um, survey together with the district. So I think each year we'll just keep improving on it. Yeah, great. Thank you. Outstanding. Thank you very much for, for all the excellent work and the feedback. Uh, deeply appreciate it. Thank you. Um, all right. On the agenda, there's uh, the financial statements and warrants. Is that going to be fairly brief tonight? Should be. Outstanding. Let's do that and maybe jump into the public comment. Great. So uh, there were 21 warrants signed since the last meeting. Uh, that was totaling $187,195.29. Uh, that amount was for two months of warrants because the March meeting, we didn't have a warrant presentation because of the uh, public hearing for the budget. So. Um, it's a little bit larger than it typically is. I did send you all an email um, that we're working on getting payroll up in the system. So you've heard me say this a couple of times this year that we've been trying to get all of the elementary schools uh, running on the database versus doing manual journal entries. And I'm so relieved to say we're finally there, but it does require some back entry of payroll. So I did not send you the reports because when I pulled them myself earlier this week, knowing that my team was in the middle of the process, um, until they're finished, accounts are very much out of whack right now. So it was actually showing that we were underfunded for the full year, which is, I know is not the case. Um, we've just got to get everybody lined up properly because some people are paid for multiple funding sources. So splitting up that payroll in the right way. So I had hoped to send you something before tonight's meeting. You know, as of two o'clock this afternoon, they were still working. So I will get you out a report as soon as I possibly can. Um, what else did I have in there? Uh, just those couple of overages on certain expense accounts that we have already talked about, um, primarily facilities related. Building heat is significantly higher this year than usual, something that you've heard already as well. Uh, transportation costs, particularly for special education, are up. Um, so I have an inquiry to Karen Ferrandino for some greater details on that that I can provide you with next month. Um, and then I did let you know in my email too that there are three additional um, revenue sources that we have coming in. So Sunderland received a, a extraordinary relief for Circuit Breaker, which kicks into uh, place when your expenses for special education in the current year are 25% higher than they were in the previous year. Um, and with all of our extra special education transportation costs, those count towards it. Um, that that's driving us over. So they provide you relief in the current year, even though Circuit Breaker is usually a year behind like all of the other state funding. So that's one-time funding for us. Um, Circuit Breaker is only comes into play when expenses for a particular student are over the foundation threshold in the state, which is about 47,000. So we're only getting reimbursement of about 70% on anything over that 47,000. So it's a complicated formula. It doesn't apply to all students in the district because most of the students do not meet that $47,000 threshold. 
Um, but we do have a couple in this instance that we are getting some funding back. So that's extra money we're going to use to help offset the transportation costs that, that are over budget already. Um, Sunderland also did get some extra relief related to COVID from the state. It came back to us particularly in the form of Chapter 70 funding. And while Chapter 70 funding normally would go to the town, this is specific in that it is to go to the school and not towards the town's revenue. Uh, and this applied to any district who had an increase in enrollment um, where enrollment dropped and then enrollment spiked back up coming into this current year. I believe you had to have at least five students over your prior year and a 10% increase. So there was some formula behind that. That funding also has to be spent in the current year. So we will likely make some adjustments to move some funds around uh, and help cover some of these overages that we have and then hopefully um, put a little bit into school choice as well. And then the final piece is related to school choice. So we've worked on the special education increment claims. We have this conversation every year that at this time, we put in all of our totals for any school choice student that has special education services because those come back dollar for dollar to the district. Um, I am waiting for the exact amount from the special education department, but I do believe it's going to significantly increase our um, anticipated revenue for school choice this year. So that'll be beneficial for us um, moving forward. Uh, there was one other thing not in my report. I think Darius, you wanted to talk quickly about the oil tank um, phase, three phase proposal that you sent into the town because we didn't have a capital update. So we wanted to lump that in here. Yeah, just real, real briefly that you all received the uh, memo, so to speak, I sent to the town regarding the three phase uh, approach to replacing the oil tank. Um, it's in the hands of the select board now, um, and maybe later on, um, Jeff can tell us what, if anything happened last night or with Peter there last night. Anything happened last night, Peter? Did they take action on it? Were you there? I didn't see they had a meeting. I, I don't know. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, there was no meeting last night. Yeah, we're we'll discussing it next week. Right. I always assume every Monday. That's budget season, right? Uh, yeah, Memorial Day uh, or Labor Day to Memorial Day. Okay. So, anyways, it is on there. It'll be on there. One of their upcoming agendas to to look at. So, I just want to make sure everybody knows where we're at with that. Outstanding. Any questions? No. All right. Uh, in that case, uh, let's see if we can move into uh, the uh, the public comment. I know there are a number of people who wanted to make one. Um, can you raise your hands on the um, the chat feature? All right. Let's see. Vicky, by all means. Hi. Good good evening, everyone. My name is Victoria Palmer, and I'm a member of the elementary school faculty, Union 38 co-president, and a staunch supporter of our wonderful school, students, faculty, and staff. I had hoped that select board members might be in attendance tonight, and that was really the focus of my letter, but I'm very happy to share this information with all of you and hope that it gets to the select board as well. I choose to work in Sunderland in part because of the caring community dedicated to its students, and I'm really grateful for my 18 plus years of service. But tonight, I want to acknowledge a sticky subject. Town rates of contribution for health insurance are the lowest in the Union 38 district. It's a fact how some expert members of our faculty have left for greener pastures of higher insurance contribution rates that some current members cannot afford to subscribe to the insurance and must choose between other limited, less expensive options. This deserves attention and action. As we look to hire new faculty and staff, some skilled educators seeking employment inquire about insurance choices ahead of the interview process in order to gain the most favorable option and look elsewhere based on that very low percentage point. It's a fact 
that Sunderland's insurance ratio means a lower take-home paycheck. And we all know that impacts lifestyle now more than ever. Thank you for offering another health insurance option this year with a select plan. The new option shows how much you care about weighing in employee needs with the challenging balance of working within town budgets. During previous meetings, it was mentioned how our very good quality insurance means co-pays for office visits are low. This is important, and I thank you for pointing out that singular advantage. Yet the overall cost of the insurance outweighs those co-pays for most of our members. Are you forming an insurance committee to consider town options? Please consider including members of our school community to help navigate those options. This platform of communication is indeed the only way we can have a say in the insurance planning topic, not the negotiations collective bargaining process as was previously suggested. Please show us you value our amazing faculty and staff with your support in raising the town's insurance contribution. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's see. Uh, Donna Carmody. Great, thank you so much. <clears throat> Um, my name is Donna Carmody. I teach fifth grade at Sunderland Elementary, and I love <laughs> I love this community. I love working in this caring, supportive community alongside such dedicated professionals and supportive parents and community members. Tonight, I would like to speak about the high cost of the health insurance offered by the town and the hardship of that rising cost of insurance and prescription medication and how that creates problems, hardships for many of the town's employees and their families. Sunderland's contribution to our health insurance is the lowest of the four towns in Union 38. The town's contribution is 15% lower than other nearby districts like Greenfield, Amherst, Northampton, Pioneer Valley. The high cost of insurance has contributed to some people leaving the district for districts with better benefits. The cost is even too high for some of our instructional assistants to be able to take the town's health insurance. I'm asking that you please consider raising the amount the town contributes to the cost of our health insurance to at least meet that of the other schools in our districts. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Lisa Gaylor. Hi, thanks. Um, I'm actually not here to talk about the insurance, although I do feel that they should be getting a higher percentage, but I'm here to talk about the fair share amendment. The MTA and our local Union 38 Educators Association endorse the passage of the fair share amendment. Massachusetts voters will have a once in a generation opportunity in 2022 to make sure that public education gets the permanent funding it deserves. By advocating for passage of the fair share amendment, educators and school committees are going to play a vital role in securing that future. The amendment would change the state's constitution to help address the chronic underfunding of our public schools, colleges, and universities. The amendment would add four percentage points to the tax on income above $1 million generating up to $2 billion annually for public education and transportation. This could accomplish goals such as lowering class sizes, strengthening higher education programming, reducing student debt, addressing the impacts of systemic racism on communities of color, and restoring staff to institutions that serve the common good, which have been hit hard by decades of austerity budgets. What can you do? As a school committee, you can endorse the amendment by making a resolution. You can see the sample resolution that I shared with you. If you would like further information, please reach out to me and I'm happy to provide you with that. I hope to see this on your next agenda. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Lisa. 
All right, uh, Michelle Shalik. Hi, I'm Shelly Chalik, and I work as an IA um, in third grade at Sunderland. And um, I, as well, would like to see the town contribute more to our health insurance. I've been at the school almost 19 years, maybe a little bit more. And I've had four knee replacements. And I can't tell you what a hardship the insurance has been for me. When I've had my knee replacements, um, I apply for disability and I get the disability, but that does not pay for the health insurance. I then have to pay the town back and it's about $3,000 each time. Um, I recently got divorced and I can't tell you the hardship this is on my daughter and myself. Um, I was listening to a selectman's meeting not too long ago, and it was during contract time, and it was said that many people were going to need their steps increased, and it wasn't sure, we were not sure how that was going to happen. And I totally recall one of the selectmen mentioning, well, maybe we look at contributing more to the health insurance. So if that is true, I'd really like that considered. Um, I myself have been looking for other employment. I love my job. I love the kids. I love my community in Sunderland. But if my knee goes out again, I'm in a lot of trouble. And I do not want to leave, but I do want our town to support us. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. All right, uh, Jody Frazier. Hello. So I am like Vicki. I prepared my statement thinking that perhaps a few members of the select board would be here, but I will go ahead and read what I wrote. So hello, my name is Jody Frazier and I teach fourth grade at Sunderland Elementary School. I love working here. SES is a caring, supportive community with hardworking teachers. We are a part of a community that supports and cares about its school and its teachers. But tonight I would like to speak about the town's health insurance. Sunderland's contribution to our health insurance is the lowest of the four towns in Union 38. The high cost of insurance has contributed to some people leaving our district for districts with better benefits. It creates financial hardship for some employees and their families. The cost is too high for some of our instructional assistants to be able to even take our town's health insurance. I am asking that you consider raising the amount the town contributes to the cost of our health insurance. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Matthew Howell. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to speak tonight about the community of Sunderland a community uh, where I have been very fortunate to serve as a teacher for nearly 25 years. If we take a closer look at this town's contribution uh, to its employees' health insurance, we notice right away that the 60% contributed by Sunderland lags behind the other schools in the district. But when we look around at neighboring districts and towns, we, we see Mohawk Regional, Pioneer Valley Regional, and Leverett contributing 75%, and Montague, Amherst, Northampton and Greenfield contributing 80%. This is a difference of thousands of dollars, not only for teachers like myself, but also for our hardworking instructional assistants who earn far less. And other town employees, including our first responders, DPW workers, librarians, and town hall employees. I do not believe that the community of Sunderland, which sends its children to our school, has elected school committee members and select board members to your positions would want Sunderland to continue to be the worst in the Valley in this regard. For I know that this school and this town also shows itself to be the best in so many other ways. One example is our walk and roll to school day tradition, which officially began 10 years ago by encouraging students and their families to walk, ride their bikes, scooters or roller skates to school, we have a fun, healthy, and planet 
friendly movement that has won a number of awards and has higher participations than any other school in Franklin County. As the organizer of this event, I would like to invite all the dignitaries here, school committee members, uh, select board members, town manager, Superintendent Modesto, who I think came one time maybe on his son's bicycle, to join us uh, next Wednesday morning, May 25th at 8.15, and feel the energy of our children, our entire school community, as we come together, like no other town in the area, to walk and roll. Thank you. Thank you. And Jacqueline Petrino. Hello, and thank you so much for this opportunity to speak today. My name is Jackie Petrino, and I'm teaching third grade at the wonderful Sunderman Elementary School. I am so delighted to be a part of this amazing community. I moved here uh, this past summer from Colorado to be closer to my family, and I feel so fortunate to be able to be at a school that truly includes and welcomes everybody. I was very disappointed when I discovered that the town only pays 60% of our health care. I came from a district in Colorado that not only had a free health clinic, but it also offered single pair, single, uh, single coverage health care for a very minimal charge. I understand that this is a smaller district, but it is concerning that there is a, a large discrep discrep dis sorry, I'm nervous, discrepancy between the amount covered by the other towns, Waitley, Deerfield, and Conway. Had I realized that they offered more healthcare coverage, I would have actively sought out a position in one of those towns. I wonder if this financial difference also limits Sunderland's ability to get top quality candidates to join the faculty. In addition, I also want to mention that many teachers are working two jobs in order to make ends meet, further putting a burden on them to provide for their families. We no longer live in a society where teachers are all working to contribute to a second income in a family. Personally, I am uh, providing for my daughter and son by myself, and the health care is a big expense. Last, I would like to express my gratitude that I have for this great community. I have had a wonderful year at Sunderland. It's probably the best year I have had ever teaching. The students are amazing. The faculty is supportive and wonderful. The administration is great. I'm, I'm so happy and grateful to be a part of it. It would be amazing if you guys could help out and um, kind of uh, make it more equal around the, across the, the board. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jackie. All right. I believe that's all we have for public comment. I didn't know if there was anyone yeah, else who was reading a statement on behalf of anyone else. All right, no other hands up. Uh, let's see. On to uh, principal's report, please. Ben. Good evening, good evening, everyone. Um, so Mr. Howell touched on it a little bit earlier, but our award-winning walk and roll to school program is being held next Wednesday, May 25th. Uh, this is, marks the 10th anniversary of this wonderful tradition. Um, we are also including, one thing he didn't mention, a bike rodeo this year. And that will feature bike safety tips and a biking obstacle course, which is going to be put on by our local Safe Routes to School representative. And then uh, next Friday, May 27th, uh, Sunderland faculty, staff, students, and some parent volunteers will uh, partake in Sunderland in Action Day, which is the day we give back to the community by performing different community service projects, mostly on our school campus and some select locations around town. The main project this year will feature the remulching of the back playground, and that's much needed. And then finally, on Tuesday, June 14th, the day after school ends, with the help of our town highway department and parent volunteers, uh, the chain link fence, play structures, and safety surface will be removed from our early childhood playground. USA Waste and Recycling and Delta Sand and Gravel have kindly offered to take materials at no cost. And through this effort, we are saving approximately $20,000 um, by completing this portion of the project outside of the scope of the contractor's work. 
uh, the contractor is then set to begin basically once that portion of the project is, is finished. And that's what I have for the principal's report. Any questions? Any hands? All right. Let's see. MASC policy update, uh, section D, fiscal management goals. Looks like we have a vote there. That was uh, read the last time around. Any discussion? All right. No discussion. I guess we'll uh, take a moment. Oh, Jessica, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I, I just had a question. So we're doing the um, section D policies right now, right? The fiscal management one? Yeah, one of them seemed like it was just for regional schools. Are we voting on all of them or just the ones that are for non-regional schools? Darius, can you just clarify? So we, we have always just um, kind of packaged them out and done, had people vote, having the district vote, have all the same policies throughout the district. Because right now okay. when we post them online, it's Frontier and Unit 38, it's as one. Um, so, you know, we could indicate in the bottom it's not, but the ones that are, so anyone that has a dash one next to it is a regional policy. And so it basically says it's a regional policy. So you can have a regional policy, but it doesn't apply to you because you're not a regional school district. So out of ease, we just kind of group it together, then we'll upload them together. And then we have one policy handbook for all the schools. There are somewhere in the book, there is a few that are not approved by some committees. Um, so it is possible not to. So you don't have to, but at the ease, we just did it as one group. I guess I could have pulled it out for the four schools, but I didn't. <clears throat> Any other questions? All right. Um, I'll move to approve the, uh, the policy D uh, as submitted. Second. All right. Uh, if there's no discussion, Megan? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Peter? Yes. Keith? Yes. Greg? Yes. All right. Unanimous. Life is good. Uh, COVID update. That's not going to be good news. There is. Yeah, well, it's better than last week. Um, so, you know, last week, as you, as you may know, you know, kind of catching people up with what happened last week, last week we had a spike in a couple of our schools, um, Deerfield and Conway saw a major increase in, um, Frontier is seeing that this week. Um, you know, right now Sunderland has kind of kept a steady trickle of a few cases a day. Um, if you look on the, um, dashboard, you can, you can follow along there. Um, I did send out a note last, well, two notes, um, you know, one on Sunday, and then a stronger one on Wednesday after our pool tests came back and I got feedback from members of the community um, about recommending masks um, due to the, the number of increases. Um, so again, you know, looking at the numbers today um, and over the weekend, there were two cases today and two cases from over the weekend for some of the elementary. Um, you know, when I said Frontier had a larger one, they did have 12 cases today, um, you know, which kind of matched what we saw last week. Um, between Deerfield and Conway, where they had a, a larger number on those days. So um, so right now that's the, you know, the, what we are doing is in classes that where there are um, two or more cases, we are letting the class themselves, we're seeing a note to that class to let families know that there um, are multiple cases in the classroom that we're recommending masking and encouraging masking. Um, you know, because because classroom transmission could be possible. Um, and classroom transmission could be possible any day, but it's even more so when you have multiple active cases in the classroom. Um, and so that's kind of where we're at. I kind of put it down there for questions. And last week, obviously, we saw numbers going the wrong direction. Um, I think we're seeing this across the, the valley. Um, when I talk with other superintendents, uh, you know, basically, the state said that they were, you know, they said that they would see a drop this week. I think we're probably a week behind the rest of the state in, in from Eastern Mass, but um, I think Eastern Mass last week still saw a rise in sewer uh, in sewer numbers. So I'm not sure where they're getting that numbers from when they when they're talking about it coming down this week. But you know, more people are outside than ever. Perhaps that's going to help. 
Thank you. Yep. Questions? Jessica? Darius, can you tell us um, what sort of conversation has been had with uh, staff, with teachers and administrators about their choices to mask? Are we particularly encouraging masking of staff for modeling for children, for supporting children who want to mask but feel peer pressured not to? No, I, 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 the staff are in the same direction as the community that they're recommended and that they have a choice in that as well. I, I wonder about this because, I mean, I, I've discussed this with Darius, but for, for the sake of our public conversation here, um, right now, 65% of the people who are hospitalized in Massachusetts um, were believed to have been fully vaccinated when they contracted COVID, people who are hospitalized for COVID, um, which is a really clear indicator that people who have underlying pre-existing conditions, also known as health disabilities, um, are still at high risk of severe COVID. And we have people like that in our community. It, you know, most of us, if we catch it at this point, we're likely to have mild cases, especially if we're vaccinated. But even people who are doing everything right have been vaccinated and double boosted are still at risk of ending up in the hospital or even dying. Um, and that includes family members of kids in school. It includes staff members who've spoken up. Um, and as we're, you know, we've got two other items talking about equity tonight. I just want to make sure that we are, as a school, um, making a point of being a safe and supportive environment for those families who have health disabilities. Um, and one way that we could do that would be by making sure that the adults in the building are all masked when they're out and about the building. Um, on my side, I, I assume this goes without saying, but uh, I, I'm assuming that you have the school uh, nurse, the uh, school health coordinator, and the the town uh, boards of health are all in constant communication. So the no, I, I've not been in communication with the Sunderland Board of Health. There's a um, changeover power there uh, with the recent election. I did contact Keelan Rock before the election. Um, and ran by the numbers of that week, which was going on. Um, so it was a Saturday. It was a Friday was when the CDC came out. Um, I talked with her on that Friday. It was kind of our last conversation, I guess, as a board of health member. Um, so, but I am in constant contact with Carolyn Ness, who's kind of a, one of the uh, kind of the leaders in the area, of, you know, uh, of the different boards of health in their, you know, their biweekly meetings. Um, so, you know, I you know, talked there, you know, today. So, Changing of the guard. Yeah, um, you know, with every, you know, with pull up, you know, she wants to pull updates whenever we have that and, you know, checking the the numbers within the, the dashboard and such. So, um, you know, Jessica's, you know, comment has made it, you know, her and I had that discussion. We're somewhat a part of that discussion regarding that. Um, you know, there's, the current the current strain going through is pretty mild, um, and I know that there are also you know there there's going to be hospitalizations um, as well, and you know this is kind of where I stand on things. I think you know we had higher numbers during January when both sides were masked, when everybody was masked, and so you know I, I'm not sure that masking for all for right now is is the proper step. But you know, I mean, my seat. I think my opinion is is you know while I'm talking with a lot of people and a lot of other. Schools are following that same direction. There are some schools that are choosing to mask. You know, um, they have much higher rates. If you look at Northampton, Northampton High had over 67 cases in one day. That's a significant outbreak to, you know, the trickle effect that we're seeing right now um, in Sunderland Elementary. But, you know, you have the ability to discuss that and direct me as you choose. I'm not trying to request that we mandate masks, but I really wish that we would ask all staff, teachers and administration to mask around the building, to model for children, that this is how we care for each other at this moment in history, when we still have community members who are at risk of serious disease. Any additional discussion, comment? All right. Thank you. Now I'm uh, a little bit uh, unsure here. 
Donna added uh, health insurance to the agenda, but I'm not sure it made it into the window where it's permissible to be on there as, as an agenda item. Um, let's see, that came out Monday. Go ahead, Peter. Oh, I just I just want to say that we have uh, Jeff Kravitz, who's the Sunderland Town Administrator here, who obviously has been listening to uh, the comment public comments so far, and I would just hope that we would uh, find a way to engage in conversation with him about uh, you know the the insurance issue from his perspective and so on, so that we could move things forward a bit and. Um, Obviously, there's no in there's no plan to take a vote or anything like that. But no. I, I would hope that we could, you know, be, be, be use our time well here. Indeed, I don't see that Jeff is still on. Yeah, I, he's here. He is? Yeah. Yeah, I'm here. Outstanding. Um. So. I wanted to add this because I understood that uh, there was some discussion going on within the select board, and I thought that there may be some uh, useful overlap. I, obviously, you had an opportunity to speak during public comment. If there's anything you care to say now, by all means, feel free. Um, Just a couple of things, I think. Um, first, I'll uh, send all the written public comments um, to, to the select board. I'll send them the recording of this. So for all of those who are disappointed, I mean, the, the issue was um, we didn't post an open meeting. And so to avoid any potential open meeting law violations, I advised them not to attend um, or, or to attend and stay muted. Um, but you know, I knew it was going to be recorded. I knew I was going to be attending, so they, they'll certainly hear about this. Um, and then, uh, just a two two things because I, I want to take this opportunity to to have a conversation, and or I guess start a conversation. <laughs> Maybe not have one is the right way to phrase it. But you know, there's a question about the insurance advisory committee. Um, the agenda hasn't been approved for the next select board meeting, but that's the on the topic, the issue is um, the law says that if you're going to make changes to your insurance plans, you have to have this committee and it has to be made up of certain people. And so, um, but it, 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 you know, the makeup is the people that are going to be affected by this. So I, I, am, I can't promise anything, but I would be shocked if there wasn't a representative, at least one representative of the school as part of that committee. So that was one question. Um, there were also some comments about the, obviously the, the employer contribution to insurance. Um, and, and I think those were accurate as far as the percentages. Um, but I just wanted to clarify that, you know, the, the health insurance that the town offers is, is a, it's a great plan. I mean, you know, we talked about co-pays, but that, that's just the beginning of it. Um, you know, there's no cost for x-rays, um, unlike other plans which require the, uh, you to pay for it unless your deductible's been met. Um, high cost imaging, MRIs, CAT scans, no cost for those. Um, others have costs even after deductibles have been paid. No cost for outpatient surgery, no cost for inpatient admissions. Uh, Prescriptions were mentioned. We also have lower cost prescriptions than anywhere else in the district. So I think to say that, you know, we're paying a lot more and all you're doing is get it seeing like a $5 savings and co-pays is, is not 100% accurate and, and it's a much bigger plan um, or, or the benefits of the plan are, are significant. And I think that if, if the goal is for the town to be paying um, a higher percentage of, of the premium every month, then that's certainly something that can be accomplished, but it, we're going to have to look at the benefits as well. Um, I think that, that the things that are going through my mind during this discussion are, you know, we did the calculation of, Hey, if we just increased the town contribution from 60 to 65%, what would the cost be? It would be about, um, $46,000 if there were no additional people on insurance. 
So as you make it more affordable, and, and I understand it, it should be affordable and we tried to provide affordable options, but the more affordable you make it, the more people get on, the higher the cost goes because the town's paying 65% of all those new people as well. So trying to get an understanding of what the actual cost would be um, is a challenge. So I think that figuring out how to offer a plan with good benefits um, that maybe the town pays a higher percentage of is certainly something that I, I think the insurance advisory committee is going to be looking at, but I just, did I freeze or did everybody else freeze? We can hear you. Okay, Greg, you look like the only person who's not frozen on my screen. So, um, okay, I'll, I will continue then. Um, yeah, so the, that that's sort of the the balancing that's going on in my head is how do we how do we increase the um, employer contribution uh, without you know losing all the benefits of the, that we have in the plan. Um, so uh, hopefully that information is helpful. I would also say that if there are other public comments um, or people who didn't write out their public comments and they want that shared with the select board. You can always email me, um, townadmin at townofsunderland.us, and I'll, I will pass that along. Um, so, or, or if there are things that you want to communicate to me and not to the select board, you can email me that too. Um. Keith? Uh, I think, um, like Jeff was alluding to, there's a, a lot of moving parts to health insurance in attending the select board meetings over the last few weeks. Um, I, I definitely learned a lot, especially about where the costs are going to come. If you have somebody who's relatively healthy, are uh, you going to balance the cost of health care on the people who are um, would need the services more, uh, higher co-pays. If you have to do any kind of health patient services, it's going to be much worse. If you're going to drop something else, something else is going to go up. So it's really complicated. But what I did hear from the select board was when Jessica was really advocating for a change this year. What I heard from the select board was that it was very late in the budget process to, to do it and that there should be representation next year at the beginning of the budget process. It seemed like the select board was open to changes, but I think there needed to be uh, union and school committee participation early on in the, um, the budgeting process. And so I think starting you know like next november october november when we really start into the budget process having that representation could be really uh effective um hmm. public comment is uh okay go ahead vicky hello this is victoria palmer i just wanted to make a public comment here regarding ed administration and the, uh, the the issue surrounding health insurance. I'd like to say that uh, we are stakeholders of the insurance and we have not been asked as members of our community before to participate in any sort of uh, committee. So we are definitely interested in participating and look forward to that process. Thank you for this defined benefit, which we do appreciate. Outstanding. Okay. Let's see, town park representation. Um, it turns out that uh, there there is a body that town park trustees, which includes, right. yep. Uh, I think Peter had his hand up. Yeah, I just, I just was wondering of the, of the members of the school committee the school community that are here that made public comment if any one of them particularly would care to be on insurance committee um if the town uh you know the town will put that together i can't say that this would guarantee you would get on it but we'd like to know who might be interested and so i'm seeing here uh vicky and donna that's two good starters that's great i just um at least your name can be you know mentioned at the select board meeting is here we have a couple of people who teach at the school that have been teaching there for a long time and that uh, would be interested in being involved and i think that would be a useful thing to do so jeff are you back on 
<laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Um, okay, so can you add Vicki Palmer and, and Donna Carmody to, uh, they're both longtime teachers at the school who would be interested in being involved with the insurance uh, group? So, yeah, I think on Monday we're going to talk about um, the makeup of the group and how that works, but the just so anybody who's interested, um, Mass General Laws Chapter 32B, Section 3, uh, defines sort of the insurance advisory committee makeup, and it says that uh, persons to be duly elected or appointed to membership on such committee by organizations of the employees affected. So I would imagine that it would be up to uh, the school employees to elect or the school committee to appoint who would serve on that. Um, but I can start, you know, so I, I, I don't know how you, you all want to handle that if you want to take a poll or a school committee just elect, but that's my sure. I got a question on this. Is this something, I mean, this is where this is kind of broken is, it's, is we couldn't address this in collective bargaining. And so I guess my question is, just for everybody to understand that, you know, normally this would occur in collective bargaining as one of the major benefits of, you know, of a, of a, of a contract. So is someone from the union, when they're talking about the, the service, it would be someone from the union? So. <laughs> you know, I, I need to get clarity on that. I would assume it would be somebody from the union. I think we would get somebody from the police union. That doesn't mean that the school administration might not want to appoint somebody because they have access to health insurance too and aren't represented by the union. Um, so interest may divide. So I, I think that's, that's my goal um, of Monday night select board meeting is to get clarity on what those organizations of employees affected are in the town of Sunder. You know, I could, I could see, DPW employees being one of the organizations, fire, police, you know, um, so getting a clear view and uh, ha having a balanced committee is, is sort of the goal. Does, does that answer your question, Darius, or no? It does. I was just, you know, looking at some of the challenges they're going to, I mean, when someone left and went on a different insurance plan than the other three towns, we now have the discrepancy of what the different plans are. And it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like shopping at, um, you know, Costco, nothing, none of the products you can find anywhere else are really price to price compare. You know what I mean? You're buying a lot of something or what, you know, in, in quantities and all that other stuff. And so that's my bad analogy, but you understand what I'm saying that you, it's very hard to compare when you, when one pays for x-rays, but the other doesn't pay for hospital visits or versus and that versus that kind of thing. Um, because yeah, I guess I'm looking at the bigger picture because, you know, there are other, you know, towns that are, the towns are, you know, range from 70 to 65 to 60, you know, and so it's going to be a conversation that's not your problem as a Southern administrator, but I'd like to see across the board, you know, that kind of unity um, for all the things. But maybe it'll be done in segments and we move each along because I guess you have to have a goal of what is the goal of the insurance group to improve benefits would be probably the overarching goal because it may not just mean 65%, as you mentioned earlier, Jeff, it may mean you know, looking at the different benefit packages to make them better, right? Um, whatever better means to the group. All right, all right, I'll get back to my, I think I made things more confusing. Any other comments? All right, on to town park representation. It turns out the Sunderland uh, town park, uh, especially with the pavilion, is uh, there's a board of trustees that consists of the chair, who in this case is uh, Mr. Ken Cushy, um, a uh, the principal of the Sunderland Elementary School, which is Ben, and one member from school committee. And uh, it may be that in coming years, when we divide up duties, right, we'll probably hand out, you know, just like someone might volunteer to represent the collaborative, uh, the representation of the town park is is something that uh, we can price out. Uh, currently, there's a 10-year agreement in place where the volunteer fire department, uh, on a non-exclusive basis, is collecting the fees uh, when that the park is 
rent it out for special functions and then uh, also keeping up with the maintenance, etc. Uh, but it looks like uh, the town trustee, the uh, town park trustees still have a duty to oversee that and uh, report out to the town. So that's, if anyone is extra interested in town park stuff, uh, feel free to get ready for the uh, upcoming, I think we do that in the fall when we split out the duties. All right. I don't know, Ben, if you had anything you wanted to add or if anyone wants to. All right, good deal. Um, school choice recommendations. This is good stuff. Ben? Hi, everyone. Um, so we have uh, received, um, actually, I'm going to present my screen here just so we can see. So um, this spring, we've received applications for school choice in uh, sec uh, grade levels, kindergarten, third grade, fifth grade, and sixth grade. And at this time, we are recommending um, school choice openings in kindergarten, third, and, and fifth. Uh, as you can see from the uh, this document, even with the grade levels where we haven't received applications, um, we do have uh, one or greater. And that's in the event, um, and Darius, correct me if I'm wrong, but by, by law, if we are a school choice school, we have to have that number in the event that a current Sunderland family moves out of town but, but would wish to keep their kids enrolled at Sunderland Elementary School. Yeah, you never want to close a grade level because you can't open it after you close it. So, you know, um, and that would exactly happen if you had a fourth grader this year or next year, rather, leave the district but want to stay under school choice and you close that grade, then you can't accept school choice in that grade. So it's best to always keep it Ben's a little alligator eating the one, as I remember yeah. that math class. So um, it's the same process every year where we look at overall numbers um, as part of the um, equation, but also um, we consider class makeup and, and needs. And at times that factors into um, whether or not we're looking to bring in um, school choice students for a particular grade level. And where you see the uh, the range for um, projected total number of grade level students, um, that just means uh, we've accepted some, but have not heard back from uh, those families yet. So it could be that range of, of number of students. Any questions? Hey ben, I'll throw you a softball. The number for kindergarten, is that you know, based on what you got coming out of preschool. So, you know, you know well, uh, so our preschool, we have um, a combination of, excuse me, for kindergarten, we have uh, a combined total of 19 um, uh, current preschoolers and in town community students who have um, registered for kindergarten. And then um, the seven out of the seven pending applications for school choice all have been accepted and um, three have communicated to the school that they would like to come to Sunderland next year. And that brings us to 22 and with the four more bringing us to 26. Jessica? Just want to confirm, we're looking at having two sections for every grade other than second grade next year, right? Correct. And so this year, the only grade level with one section is first grade. And so that just, it's, it's bumping up one level next year. Peter? I think the role of the school committee here is just to 
in general, approve participation of the school in the school choice program, but the actual numbers are determined by the administration. Is that, is that correct? You can block, um, you can block off grade levels if you wanted to, because um, that can, I think I said years ago that it's only a yes or no vote. That's what I have to report to the state, but the school committee does have the authority to cap the number of school choice numbers in certain grades because it does have a budgetary effect. So in our particular, we, what we've done is we've made it the, the school committee vote to make it the administrator's discretion. Um, that way, you know, um, open up every level and then allow Ben to um, accept where um, there's room and where, you know, each, the dynamic of that grade can allow more students because sometimes with, you know, folks watching at home, you realize that you, know, you look at, you know, 26 in a class, you can re really easily add more people, but you know, you don't know what the breakdown of that class is, their behavioral, behavioral or needs of, the, of some of those students that, that stretches, that makes that number actually bigger um, when it comes to classroom management and uh, and such. I, I do want to comment while I still am speaking is that, is that those, those grade level numbers in the early grades, you know, right now are going to be, are rather small. Um, and I think it is important that we, we're seeing greater need in the younger grades coming out of COVID. And so we're watching that. And we, we don't mind that those numbers are small next year so that we can continue to address the needs of those early childhood classes. You know, if we have a 19 and when it reaches grade four, you know, then we can have a conversation about, um, I'm, I'm projecting that far ahead. It doesn't mean we can't look at it next year and the year after, but you know, then we can look at it combining that to a single team class at that time, depending on whether the needs of those classes. I'm just saying generalization, when someone looks at 19, there could be 19 in a first grade class, but we also want to break that number down because we also have a history in Sunderland of having um, an influx of students, um, you know, based on the um, housing market that we have in our, in town that can allow families to move in suddenly. Um, so, having that flexibility in the early years. So I want to say that we're watching that. Ben and I had discussions regarding that and Shelly was involved in that as well. Peter? So I'll make a motion that uh, we approve the administration school choice recommendations for the school year uh, 2022 to 23. Second. All right. Uh, Keith? Yes. Megan? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Peter? Yes. Greg? Yes. All right. Let's see. MS, MASC policy update, section A, foundations and basic uh, commitments. So we've got a first read here. So you do have a first read on this. So it is kind of... Um, it's heavy reading because it is talking about um, policies of sexual harassment, non-discrimination, um, and, and, and such. Um, I did send out an email today that we received. I had a conversation with um, Kimberly, uh, Kimberly Roach from our, um, Dupre's office, who kind of does the policy section with them, because they sent me an updated version, and I was confused as why MASC is sending one and they're sending another. Um, I tried to explain that email, but I'll try to explain it now even more so, that they said it's really important, that, and what I'm talking about is ACAB, is that when you're talking about sexual harassment policy, you really need to define one for employees and one for students. And it's because of, Title IX protects students um, for sexual for se discrimination by sex, which includes harassment and sexual violence. So... So instantly, when you have a sexual harassment, you are also enacting Title IX. And there's a whole different investigative process when you're, when you're dealing with that federal law. And so it's important to keep the two separate um, within your policy. And MASC is not doing that. Um, they're contacting MASC why they're not um, recommending that. Um, but that's why they, they, they said we prefer you, you, you break that policy into two sections so that you're dealing with both. Or else you're going to have more confusion. It's all there, they said, but it's, it makes it more confusing um, under the single policy. So you'll see that, and I and I also added the um, the Title Nine um, the update on the Title Nine material as well. I don't have it in front of me. Um, so any so 
Again, it's a thick read. If you have questions, especially complicated ones, please email me because this is stuff that's all, I didn't write it, you know, the, you know, the attorneys did. And so, you know, I can reach out to them and, and get answers at the full meeting um, and such, because we'll vote it on it in June. Outstanding, all right. Policy procedure revisions, JFAR admissions procedures, R1 admission procedures, uh, K through six, and administering JLCD, administering medicines to students, also first read. So our our nurse, some of our nursing uh, policies need to be updated every two years, and these these two are due. Um, and the quickly the the changes, I'll just kind of quickly read out loud the changes that may give me a list of what the, the major changes were under JC under JLCD, which is um, you know the, the, the delegation of uh, medicines. Um, there's updates on use of use of Narcan in the school to be more compliance with the new laws around Narcan and um, adding a paragraph about storage of prescriptions, adding clarifying language about self-administrating um, and adding section of documentation, sections on documentation, delegation, and special circumstances under um, uh, delegation of uh, medications. Under JFAR and JFAR1, um, they're basically are looking at the immunizations that are that are required by Massachusetts Department of Public Health, getting those up to date so that the two are in exact alignment with each other, um, and then also making sure that families are families who can't get vaccinated due to life situations such as homelessness and other um, other barriers that the school is working with them. It's not what we used to do in education 30 years ago, where you weren't vaccinated, you just you know, put your hand up and you say you can't come to school. Our nurses work very hard to work with families, um, even calling to set appointments, finding them vaccinations if they don't have access to a doctor's office um, and finding it for them for free. So, um, you know, that's put into the policy as well. So that one will be voted on as June as well. If you have a on that, let me know. Peter, your hands up. No, oh, it's okay. a mistake. No worries. All right. Uh, point a regionalization uh, subcommittee representative. So this was brought up at the joint meeting. We are looking to put together a subcommittee to put together um, a, right now we do not have a Union 38 superintendency agreement, which basically explains how you do some of the functionings of your Union 38. Um, the most easiest thing to explain is my position. Um, you know, you, there's no um, direction on how the hiring process works for the superintendent. What if you came down to two candidates and the Sutherland committee wanted to do one thing, the Deerfield committee wanted to do another thing. There's no language on how you rectify those issues. And so, um, and I think when we went through the search, I said this at the joint meeting, um, not my search, but the search prior to that, I was in the search committee. And so I was in the executive session with the school committee, but there was discussion that this is how it is done. And it was based on the knowledge of people who had been around for a while. You know what I mean? And so that we need to come to an agreement. And it really, when there's not tension around that is when we need to solve this problem, not when there is tension around the, the and that kind of thing. And it's not just the superintendent's position. Um, there's some other things that the, 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 the regional, um, not the regional, the, the superintendency oversees that I want to make sure we get all that into a, some sort of agreement. Um, so this committee will work, will start up in September. And it, depending, we're going to basically do a dive in. I'll, I'm already starting to collect information on it, but it goes dive in. was like, what do we need? What are we missing? And then put something together to come back to the committee to vote on. And then it's going to have to go to the towns to agree on. So it's, there's a few big steps here um, that need to be taken. But I think it's important to do. And I know there was concern at the joint meeting that by one member that, you know, you're opening up this, you know, you open up this can of worms. Um, I'm going to tell you, I think you have a problem because not only does it take how do you hire a superintendent, but how do you remove a superintendent? And so if there's suddenly disagreement about the, the functioning of a superintendent and and I'll throw Shelly under the bus as well, or Shelly, um, or the business manager, you know, you need to have a process for, you know, that you can have a process, not just um, without one, you're going to be, you're going to find yourself in a tight spot. So um Anyway, so that's when the, the committee would work through next year, and we'll set up our own timelines from that committee based on the amount of work. 
obviously also get legal counsel involved um, and so on and so forth. So that's the idea. And we're looking for one member from each committee or more, I guess, if um, you want to, um, to join them. Anyone super excited? If not, Greg, you can assign someone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're going to reorganization since we're not doing it to September. <clears throat> Fair enough. Uh, I, I may jump on that one, but uh, okay. If, if no one else is super excited. All right. Um, let's see. Curriculum Management Solutions Equity Audit. I, I said something profound too. Um, Sarah Mitchell and myself and Kim um, McCarthy, um, when she was working with us, um, have been talking about bringing in an outside audit um, to look at all our schools. And, um, you know, we went into our anti-racism and equity work. You know, many times you'd start with an audit and then go into that work kind of work, or you'd start with some kind of examination of where we're at. Um, and we kind of decided to hold because we knew some where there's some of the gaping areas of where the committee was jumping into and getting work done. Um, at the same time, we also want to look at all areas of our schools, not just anti-racism and other marginalized groups, but you know, looking at all students in from special needs to advanced learners to looking at all data points and that kind of thing. And curriculum management solutions is a uh a company that's done audits nationwide. It is the company that Sarah Mitchell um, does do audits with. Um, how, and you, you know, every, every now and then I share that she's gone to somewhere to, to work on a team to do audits. Um, and so um, I'm, I wanna bring this group in to audit, not just Sunderland, but all the elementary schools in Frontier Regional. Um, and when you look through what the product they, if you had time to look through this, if you haven't had time to really just skip to where the summary of proposed services, is um, basically they break down, you know, all the different data points they're going to look at. They then will come a visit to our schools. They'll do interviews and, and basically um, come back with a report for us of where our needs are. And they're going to do some deficit reporting. It's not a feel good report. They're going to come back with you know recommendations and such. And I'm bringing this to school committee. You know, within my jurisdiction, I could just go ahead and move forward with it. But I really want school committee to be on board because I want this document to come to school committee. And so that we all have ownership of the next steps. And um, right now it's looking like this will happen in March. Um, they're already booked for the fall. Um, and we probably will get the report in May. Um, it's in about six weeks following their visit. Um, so they're looking at a visit in March. Um, yeah, so that's kind of where it is. It is pricey, um, but we are paying for, we're not paying for volunteers where, you know, those of you have been part of like a NEASC report where they kind of get, administrators and volunteers, or they get some small stipend. Um, these are paid professionals that come in. Um, we're experts in the field. Um, the cost is $35,500. Um, that's with an estimated amount for when they're staying here and travel and such. Um, we are be paying for it out of um, grants and out of some of the ESSER three money that we put aside for professional development, because I think this will help steer the proper professional development on the next step, um, because I think we do need to have um, this level of, level of analysis on the outside coming in with a fresh lens, um, you know, to look through and a lot of the stuff you can kind of, sometimes you can do yourself, but it's also when you have an outside group doing it, um, there's no bias there. You know, there's no, we always do that because that's the way it is. And we, you know, refuse to look at it. So, so I am looking for, just tonight, I'm looking for a vote of support that, so that by voting of support means I'll bring this report back to you next spring and we'll together kind of go through it and make changes to our district as we see appropriate. Go ahead, Peter. Can you hear me? Great. Okay. Um, I guess I had a question. What percent of this would cover this, the, um, stuff that's been the focus of the anti-racism and equity. Would that, would, would that part be like a large part of this or would that part be a relatively small part of this? Um, it would be a relative, I don't want to say it's a small part because they're going to look at all groups. So, um, 
you know, when you kind of go through, the, you know, race and, um, you know, race is one factor, but they're also going to be looking at social economic status. They're going to be looking at gender. They're going to be looking at, you know, you know, all types of groups within, within the school, you know, um, high achieving students, what are the makeup of high achieving students classes? What does special ed population look like? Where are the, what are the makeup of those classrooms? What's happening in those classrooms? Where's the funding going? Um, in our budgets to these different things, what kind of staffing are we doing toward different groups um, and different programs? So there, you know, there, it's not. It is looking at um, equity through the lens of racism, but it's not a racism audit. It's an equity lens. It's looking at all students and everyone that we serve, and and how are we putting our resources and and such toward that? You know, um, and you know, they they do. Very, they do huge districts, and they, they have to tailor this down to our needs, and that's what they are doing here in this proposal. Um, they also do, you know, districts that serve, you know, forty thousand students. You know what I mean? And so they, where you have a very different kind of audit. You know, this one they they this has been tailored to us in looking at a district our size. <coughs> okay. So you would you would like a. We're, we're ready for a motion that would be, I'll make a motion that we support the administration's efforts uh, regarding the equity audit. Second. I'll second. <laughs> Greg, you're sorry. Yeah. Sorry, that was muted. Yep. Sorry, Jessica. Yes. Peter. Yes. Keith. Yes. Megan. Yes. Greg. Yes. Okay. So unanimous and foundation statement, anti-racism and equity. Yeah. I got one after another tonight. Um, you know, we did get a update from the Anti-Racism Equity Committee and Romney Associates at the joint meeting. And coming out of the policy subcommittee, um, you know, they were working on, and I was on the committee, that we were working on looking at policies, but there was also this kind of need to have an umbrella statement of what is the purpose of anti-racism equity, what are the, um, the definitions of anti-racism equity, and then what are our beliefs, and then where are we going with it? Um, and so basically this idea of creating a foundation statement that we can do our work under that is, you know, put into our policy handbook so people can see where our values are and then post on our website and that kind of thing. Um, we just kind of put out there. And this was the, um, this was the document that came up, um, you know, through the, from the, the policy committee, through the whole committee to move forward um, to school committee to consider um, voting on. So what I, what I want to do is treat this like a policy. Um, cause it's going to go, I think it should be part of not only our policy handbook, but also in, you know, put on our, our website so that people can see where our beliefs are. Um, I think really looking, you know, you have a chance to read through it. It is, um, it's very thorough, but in my favorite part of it is really the last page because it talks about the intentions, like where are the action steps of, um, you know, our anti-racism equity work and, um, and so forth. So it's this is a first read. Um, if you have questions on this, um, feel free to send it to me. I can, um, you, you know, I can also send it off to the committee if there, there are heavy questions or clarification or that kind of thing. But um, we can discuss it at the next meeting um, as the vote. Because I don't know if everybody's got a chance to go through it. But you can also ask me questions now. Any questions now? All right. Let's see. Endorsement discussion on fair share amendment. So Lisa Gaylor uh, read a fair share amendment. Um, that's we can vote to uh, endorse that statement. Um, it's not a policy, so there is no required reading. But I, I had it as discussion because in case people did want a chance to read it over and think about it, uh, my understanding is, and uh, anyone can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I don't think that the the vote that this is intended to influence is going to happen before our next meeting. So if we wanted to take one meeting to read through it and prep, uh, we could do that. 
or because it's not a policy, if we wanted to uh, vote it tonight, we could. I believe it's a November ballot question, so there's not a big rush, but I th Lisa, maybe you can, is, is the MTA is trying to get, build support by having more school committees pass it, right? That, that's exactly right, yeah. I would be happy to just vote on it tonight so it doesn't take up time on a future agenda. I think this is a no-brainer. All right. Any any discussion? Are we? Yeah, Peter. Um, I'm assuming that this, like other things that have uh, happened in uh, the Commonwealth in years gone by, that uh, the there will be a statement of intentions as to how the money is spent, but it's always, as they say, subject to appropriation by the legislature. And so nothing is guaranteed, or is this something that somehow they've managed to do it differently? I mean, that's been a problem with things like this in the past that still depends on what the legislature actually funds. I believe the fair share amendment, like it, it is identified as funds that would go to education and transportation. Is that I, right, Lisa? I believe it is, and I believe it's also, that's how it would be stated in the constitution. But you know, if you want to take more time to to look at that, but that is the intention: is education and transportation. All right. Do we have a motion? Make a motion to pass the resolution as provided by Lisa Gaylor and the MTA. Second. I'm, uh, I'm going to second. We don't have to, um, you know, again, we could wait and uh, reconsider if, it, if people just want to wait. Um, I always have trouble with stuff like this where, um, let's put it this way, I feel like there are big corporations and people it, way at the top of the um, income brackets who somehow always manage to, uh, despite the fact they earn a large amount of the, the total wealth that's actually created in the nation, are essentially uh, tax refugees. And uh, this measure feels like it's going after people who are Wealthy enough, they're doing pretty well, but not so ultra-rich that they can afford to, to skate off scot-free. Uh, but on balance, uh, you know, I'm comfortable with a second. And uh, if, if it's a yes or a no, uh, I'm generally in favor. Any other discussion? All right. Uh, with that, uh, we'll take a vote. Uh, Keith? Yes. Megan? Yes. Peter? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Greg? Yes. Okay. So the uh, endorsement is, is passed. Um, superintendent Greg, evaluation. Go ahead. Yeah. Just real quickly, Lisa, is the MTA collecting this or am I sending a this proposal to our reps? No, I don't believe the MTA is um, collecting. I mean, I'll I know that they're asking, you know, for us to ask school committee members. I was also going to just put in the chat, here's a, um, there's a link to the Fair Share Amendment website that has just opened up um, last week, the end of last week. So there's more information if people want to look at it, but I'll share this information with the MTA. Um, because I mean, we have the draft language. I, just, I mean, obviously, I can beautify and put it in a letterhead, and then and have Greg sign off on it. Um, yeah, that would be great, actually. Thank you very much, all of you. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, superintendent evaluation. Clock's ticking down. Yep. Basically, where we're at is uh, you have it, and um, the deadline is. Friday, yep. um, and then the I believe the chairs are going to get together and um, um, tell 
uh, create a summary, uh, a summary, a report summary for the, the superintendent, and then we'll discuss it on the June meeting. So it's more, it was just there as a kind of a, one of those things we're trying to get this in during the actual year of service rather than the year months later, which we did last time. Um, Cause I do need to submit that to the state in June, no, July. All right. Can I just add about the process that um, the way we're asked to submit it is on a Google doc form where you can only see sort of the first question and the first comment box and you have to submit something before you can see what comes up next. If anybody else wants to plan your comments ahead, I got those questions from Donna so you can know what the categories are. Um, I, I'm happy to share that. Um, last That's year, important. I remember less than two thirds of the joint school committee members gave Darius comments that were more than a sentence long. I think a, it's important for us to show our appreciation by being really specific in our feedback and not just checking off boxes. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a copy of that. All right. Um, I certainly don't have any reports. Uh, I don't, don't believe anyone's report up. Anything from a collaborative? Meeting next week. Outstanding. All right. And uh, Darius, you have a superintendent report? Oh, go ahead, Peter. All uh, right, just an update on capital stuff going on that... Uh, uh after our uh meeting on the third where we went out and looked at oil tank stuff uh, darius sent in a uh summary of uh the problems uh to the select board uh, broke it up into i think he sent a copy to everybody so you know that broke it up into a smaller first part and then a larger thing dealing with the oil tank and um talking to jeff kravitz uh he, he went over it with the select board last Monday night in the next meeting. Um, I think he's planning to, to go ahead to move forward with seeing if they will support doing the first part, which was the, the remote monitoring, the spill containment and money for an engineering study. Um, see if we can get the select board to, to sign off on that using ARPA funds. So it's, uh, it's in process and um, hopefully there'll be a positive outcome there. Outstanding. Darius, did you have anything else you wanted to add? It's just the only additional update that we did hire a uh, director of curriculum instruction for elementary um, and Dr. Laura Ramsey. And so she'll be joining us. She can join at some of our administrative meetings in June and then officially joins us July 1. Um, and so we're excited to have her aboard. Outstanding. I don't know of any reason why we go to executive session. It's down there. Okay. Uh, and so take a, a motion to adjourn. Yeah, hey, Peter. If, if you could, if you could just bear with me for a sec here, I had a couple of things I wanted to mention. Yeah. Um, first is that the town Memorial Day parade is Friday the 27th, I believe it is, six o'clock. Um, and I think all the other members of the committee got, like me, a letter from uh, Jim Ewan asking that we uh, participate as elected officials. And so I remember the last time that there was a parade, which was in 2019, I remember marching in. I think there actually Keith had stuff going on with the fire department that he was doing and somebody else and had, you know, was marching with somebody else. But I was feeling a little lonely there marching, but it's still a good thing to do. And so I would encourage uh you know, that we try and make it because it is sort of showing our public face to you know, a bunch of people watching and it, it's a good thing to do. Secondly, um, the acoustics at town meeting uh, end of April were fantastic, Ben, and, and um, I'm not sure exactly what was done and I'm not sure how much of that is repeatable without a major production by the two gentlemen that seem to be responsible for it. But I remember going, I think, again, it was also three years ago, I, I went to the sixth grade commencement and just sitting in the side bleachers, it was real hard to hear what was going on. And if there was a way of getting a similar uh, job with the acoustics for events like that, boy, it would be wonderful. So, you know, I don't know what's possible, but I just thought I'd mention it. Um, and then third, just because it's been happening this evening and I don't know what's going on, I've lost 
connection with the meeting about five times here and have, have had to, you know, exit and quickly sign on again, at which point it was fine. But I'm sitting in the same room as my router and I don't know if it's just me or if there's something that's going on, you know, something beyond just a problem here in this room. So I just thought I mentioned it. And Darius, I don't know if you know anything or can, because I, I think a couple other people, you know, seemed like things were freezing up for them too. And don't know. Anyway, thank you, Jeff. I mean, thank you, Greg. Good deal. All right. If no one has anything else, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn? Okay. Yeah. I'll, second, I'll second that. All right. Peter. Yes. Keith. Yes. Jessica. Yes. Megan. Yes. Greg, yes. Unanimous. Thank you all very much.